Hi, welcome to Pass Forward, International Conversations About History Education. Check out our website, subscribe to our Pass Forward YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, or contact us at passforward2020 at gmail.com. My name is Lindsay Gibson. I'm an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And today I'm going to be, my presentation is going to be about the case for commemoration controversy in history education. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver campus is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, who for millennia have passed on their culture, their history, and their traditions from one generation to the next on the UBC campus site. Over the past few years, there have been frequent heated debates about commemorations of, con of historical events and people in countries all around the world. These clashes can be seen as another chapter in the history wars, divisive and partisan contests over national memory, political values, historical perspectives uh, that often focus on history textbooks and curriculum, museum exhibits, and public commemorations. Commemorations are events, actions, or artifacts that honor and memorialize significant events, people, and groups from the past. There are many different types of commemoration controversies. In my home country of Canada, uh, there have been numerous controversy, controversies about commemoration, and they focused on events like significant events, uh, historical events, like Canada 150, the 150th anniversary of Canadian Confederation. The removal of statues, uh, a variety of different statues that have been featured in Canada. Most recently, the statue of Canada's first prime minister, John A. Macdonald, was torn down and toppled in Montreal. Schools and university, Ontario Elementary School Teachers, uh, Teachers Union called for renaming of any school named after John A. Macdonald. Schools and universities, Ryerson University, uh, there's been debates about removing the name of Egerton Ryerson, one of the early promoters of residential schools, and UMB struck, stripped Ludlow's name from the law faculty, Ludlow who was involved in enslavement of black people. We also have commemoration controversies about public roads, buildings and bridges. The Langevin building, named after Hector Langevin, who was one of the key architects of Indian residential schools in Canada, uh, they renamed a building that had been named after him. A bridge in Calgary named after Langevin was renamed the Reconciliation Bridge. There's been uh, controversy about renaming streets in Toronto, including Dundas Street and Russell Street, named after enslavers. And Ryan McMahon has raised awareness to the, to the naming of colonization roads throughout Northwestern Ontario. There are many other types of commemorations as well, whether that be the naming, the names of geographic landmarks like in New Brunswick, currency, plaques, public art and, and murals, sports team logos, flags, uh, and as well as contests and awards. The, the Canadian Historical Association renamed their book award uh, uh, and stripped John A. Macdonald's name from it. But what makes controversial issues, what makes these commemoration controversies so controversial? What explains why the fact that even though people uh, know and were asked whether or not they approve of removing monuments uh, to po politicians that have demonstrated racist views or implemented racist policies, still 50% of the people oppose these things. So what quite explains this? Well, according to Graver and Adrianson, uh, public controversies about collective memory and historical canons are indicators of the problems and tensions within or between societies. Scholars have used a variety of terms to describe these complex, complicated, and controversial histories, including difficult knowledge, the violent past, the sensitive past, traumatic past, and most recently, Epstein and Clark, as well as Gross and Tara, refer to these as difficult histories. Now, Gross and Tara describe five characteristics, and they say that difficult histories are central to, to nations' histories. The difficult histories challenge and refute broadly accepted versions of the past and grand narratives and stated national values. Difficult histories connect with questions or problems facing us in the present. Difficult histories often involve uh, violence, usually collective or state-sanctioned violence about partic towards particular groups. And difficult histories create disequilibria that challenge existing historical interpretations. So this helps explain a little bit about why commemoration countries are, are controversial, but there's another explanation that I think is important to, to recognize as well. So historical consciousness is defined as the complex interaction of our interpretations of the past, our perceptions of the present and our expectations for the future. Jorn Rusin created a typology uh, uh, in 2004 of four types of historical consciousness that help 
explain or better understand how people use historical narratives in the past to inform decisions in the present and future. And these four types are not seen to be mutually exclusive, but they can be read as an increasingly sophisticated uh, historical consciousness along a continuum. So I would argue that, that these commemoration controversies pit oppositional forms of historical consciousness against, against each other. On one side, we have traditional and exemplary forms. So the past provides us with permanent and prescriptive ways of living that we have to follow in the present. Exemplary forms, where the past provides examples and lessons that are instructive for us to follow uh, in terms of responding in the present or future. Those traditional exemplary forms can be come into clash, uh, come into, in, into contestation with critical and genetic forms. A critical version says that the past is no longer relevant for what's going on in the present, uh, values and needs. And so therefore counter narratives are required to deconstruct commonly accepted narratives and break continuities between past and present. The genetic idea though is that the past is different. The purpose is not to maintain or disrupt continuity between past and present, but to historicize differences. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So for example, when it comes to historical, uh, when it comes to uh, commemorations, a traditional uh, form would be very similar to what Andrew Scheer of the Canadian Conservative Party, the former leader of the Canadian Conservative Party, said about it recently about a statue of John A. Macdonald in Regina. Said, John A. Macdonald, uh, we erected these statues uh, because of his vision, the work that he did, the fact that he devoted his life to Canada, and we are the inheritors of that work, and that's why I believe it should be remembered and celebrated. So this idea that we have the past, it's informed the present, uh, that we shouldn't change, we shouldn't remove them, we shouldn't destroy them, anything willing to change those things is revisionist or presentist. The new leader of the Conservative Party in Canada, Aaron O'Toole, highlights this exemplary form of historical consciousness. He says that tearing down statues of the country's founders are dooming Canada to forget the lessons of history, that statues provide us with lessons from the past that we need to observe in the present. Now those two forms can be contrasted with a critical historical consciousness as exhibited by members of the Black Lives Matter movement who tore down and toppled the statue of John A. Macdonald. So they say that these traditional narratives are immoral, they don't help us in the present, they construct counter narratives to deconstruct these, they see that the narratives and dominant narratives that exist and the symbols and sites that preserve them should be destroyed and that new commemoration should be created to orient present day life. The, the mayor, Victoria mayor, Lisa Helps, talks about the fact that not only do we need to remove statues, and John A. McDonald's statue was removed outside of City Hall, but we need to start having signs and symbols that represent the presence of Lekwungen people, of First Nations people throughout the city. Now, a genetic form of historical consciousness is quite different in the sense that the focus is on historicizing them, that commemorations are not seen as being history, that they are products of their time, the goal is not to maintain ties to the past nor disrupt them. The idea is that we're clear, uh, a genetic historical consciousness, that these are interpretations created by individuals and groups for specific purposes, and recognize that many of the commemorations that we have, as highlighted by James Lowen in his book, Lies Across America, are incomplete, mono, uh, feature one perspective, focus on positive effect uh, aspects, but omit negative aspects, and are often discriminatory towards minoritized groups. So my argument in the last half of this presentation is that commemoration controversies are essential for history education for three main purposes. They have the potential to make history meaningful and relevant to students. They address key civic competencies and they offer generative opportunities for advancing students' historical consciousness and historical thinking. So commemoration controversies address important issues. Uh, racism, sexism, other aspects, other issues that are being faced in society, the history of colonialism, all of these things that are relevant to students' lives. Uh, Van Stratton et al. describe relevance in history as allowing students to recognize and experience what history has to do with themselves, with today's society, and their general understanding of human existence. And we know that almost every community has examples of sites, monuments, plaques, street names, and museums that have been currently are or could be controversial in the future. And these can be really engaging for students to involve them in doing history and analyzing whether or not these should be kept. In terms of strengthening civic competencies, we know that history and civic education have been inextric inextricably linked since history was first introduced in school curricula. There's broad international consensus that about a participatory conception of, of citizenship education 
defined in terms of knowledge, skills, values, and dispositions. Knowledge of democratic concepts, skills of engaging in debates, solving problems, critical thinking, but also dispositions, fair-mindedness, and respect for diverse values. Evidence suggests that inviting students to engage in these debates, uh, to invite student voice and active engagement in these kinds of issues have significant impact in fostering active citizenship. The last main reason why these commemoration controversies are so essential for history education is that they're very powerful vehicles for, and generative vehicles for nurturing historical thinking and historical consciousness. The goal of historical consciousness, according to Andreas Korber, is to provide students with the competencies, capabilities, dispositions, and skills needed to orientate independent actions as an emancipated member of society. Similarly, historical thinking focuses on teaching students to interpret and assess evidence from the past to understand, evaluate, construct, deconstruct narrative accounts of the past. So the argument here, according to Duquette, Graver, Korber, and several others, is that the concepts and process of historical thinking are essential for the development of historical consciousness. So the idea here is that inviting students to make informed judgments about commemoration controversies invites them and requires them to use their understanding of sub substantive content of and historical thinking concepts to make decisions about how to respond to commemorations in the present and also the future. Okay, so in the last three minutes of my presentation, I'm going to quickly describe four second order concepts from Peter Satius's model of of historical thinking from his framework that I think are particularly relevant for framing questions for inviting students to think uh, historically about commemorations. Analyzing monuments and statues and commemorations is complicated. They're uh, abbreviated narratives, they're ambiguous, they're proto-narratives, according to Andreas Korber. Robert, Robert Parks talks about the difficulty of interpreting them. They have their own histories distinct from a historical event and that provide a lot of evidence. So when we when we analyze, uh, we want to analyze historical commemorations as constructed sources, as uh, evidence about the past. So using some of Sam Weinberg's ideas, we might want to invite students to source a document. What kind of commemoration is being investigated? When and where was it created? Who created it? Who provided the financial support to create it? Why was it created? And where was the commemoration located and why was it placed there? We also want students to understand what was happening at the time that commemorations were created, what kind of things were going on in society. We want them to be able to closely read them, to make sense of these, uh, what symbols and artifacts and images and structures and words are used to communicate the interpretations about the past. And lastly, we wanna invite students to corroborate what they're, what they're interpreting in these, in these commemorations. Is the interpretation offered by the commemoration justifiable? What do other primary and secondary sources uh, say, do they support or refute the interpretations being made? The second big concept is to invite students to think about historical significance. Is the person being highlighted historically significant or the event being highlighted? Uh, is this someone worthy of, of uh, commemoration? For which groups and events uh, being commemorated are, so for which groups is this commemoration important to and significant to? Uh, has that uh, the importance of this commemoration changed over time. And lastly, which larger narratives about this event are being commemorated? The historical perspectives comment, uh, uh, concept invites students to think about different attitudes and beliefs and worldviews that existed at the time, but also in the present. So what did people believe about John A. Macdonald when he was alive? What do people think about John A. Macdonald when uh, a commemoration was being created, well after the fact, well after his death or at other times. What does the commemoration reveal about the values and beliefs and attitudes of the people or groups who created it and whose perspectives were included or not included? What do people think about this commemorated event today? And the fourth and last concept that I would highlight is should the event person or group be commemorated and memorialized given its historical legacy? Should the commemoration be kept as is, revised or removed? The ethical dimension imbues the study of history with meaning and expands students' historical consciousness by helping them learn from past wrongdoings, to judge the past more fairly and deal with uh, effectively with present day ethical dilemmas. So what is the final conclusion about this? Is the event aligned with our beliefs? Does, uh, uh, would the person or group's actions be acceptable today? Was the person or group commemorator responsible 
uh, for the events in which they're being commemorated. So in conclusion, uh, I just want I, I want to thank you for for watching this. And the argument that I made today is that commemorations are essential for history education. They're powerful uh, ways of engaging students and making history more relevant and meaningful. They are uh, powerful vehicles for expanding students' civic competencies, and they also are generative opportunities for advancing students' historical thinking and historical consciousness. Thank you.